Um, like I said, man, thank you so much for doing this. And uh, the, the, the reason why we're doing this, obviously, Black History Month is uh, upon us here in the next month. And Black History Month usually has us looking backwards. And I wanted to talk to you about what we are experiencing now because you essentially are black history and we're living it in present day i want to talk to you mark about your path it wasn't the traditional one to get to this <laughs> point so for everybody who isn't uh, familiar with mark eversley what did it take to get here to be the first black general manager of the chicago bulls and only the second in this city in the big five sports franchises sure sure um you know for me you know there's kind of two themes, hard work and perseverance. Um, you know, I did not take a traditional path to get to where I am today. Um, I started at Nike. I started working in a retail factory outlet store um, just north of Toronto. Um, I was part of a small team that opened up six or seven stores. Um, you know, I progressed from there. I um, became the sports marketing director for all of Canada's um, sponsorship properties. Uh, they included Canada Basketball, um, the Toronto Raptors, uh, the Vancouver Grizzlies at the time. So I'm kind of aging myself here a little bit. Um, you know, from there, I moved to Portland, Oregon, where the world headquarters are for Nike. And that's really where I started working with, you know, athletes one-on-one -on -one and figuring out, you know, what it, what it is they need to really succeed and excel on the court. Um, you know, from there, you know, I spent 11 years at Nike. There were 11 great years and, you know, I had no intentions of leaving. Um, but, you know, somebody came and took a chance on me and they offered me a job to move back home to work with the Raptors. Um, you know, I started in player development off court, working with, you know, young men and helping them acclimate and assimilate to, you know, a new city, um, you know, for, for most of them, a new country, um, you know, and I moved, progressed through the organization, player development, assistant GM, VP of player personnel. And I spent seven years there, um, seven quality years. I've worked with a bunch of great people, really smart people. Um, you know, they kind of help shape who I am today. Um, from there, I moved to the uh, Washington Wizards, Philadelphia 76ers, um, both in, you know, senior executive positions with both organizations. Um, and then obviously this past spring was approached by the Bulls to come and join their executive leadership team. And, you know, here I am today, the GM of the Chicago Bulls. Yeah, and, and the significance of that for you, because like I mentioned at the outset, you know, you're, you're the first black general manager of the Chicago Bulls and you're the second in the big five sports franchise. So what's that significance for you? Because, you know, Kenny Williams is one uh, that, you know, brought a championship to this city and Kenny has had pressures that have, you know, uh, raised and, and lowered because of the nature of the business. You are the second one in this city. And, you know, there are a lot of eyes on you, uh, you know, black eyes, white eyes, whatever the eyes are, the, the people who want Bulls basketball to succeed. What's the significance in that for you being a black man and having this job and being the first one to have it? Well, first and foremost, it brings an incredible amount of pride to me and my family. Um, you know, the Reinsdorfs have been incredibly, you know, supportive of us in our transition here. Um, you know, but I bear a lot of, you know, responsibility. And, and like you said, there's a lot of people who probably have eyes on me. Some of them probably have eyes on me because I am a black man. Um, you know, with that comes, you know, the pressures of being in this job. And I welcome all of those. Um, you know, it's a, it's a situation where, you know, like you said, you probably have a lot of people looking up to you. I hope I do. I hope I have a lot of little young kids looking up to me, both boys and girls. You know, I've reached this um, position because of hard work and perseverance. And I hope little kids can look to me and say, you know what? He reached that level because of hard work, perseverance, building relationships, doing the right things all the time, um, learning from my mistakes, um, you know, formulating my own plan, my own strategic, strategic path to where I am today. And, you know, I'm here, I'm happy, my family's happy, and I'm looking forward to uh, building a championship contender here in Chicago. Speaking of champions, Masai Ujiri, right? I mean, you, you mentioned the Raptors and your background there. Did he break down some barriers for men and women of color in front offices with the Raptors championship? And how much further is there to go? Um, you know, Masai is like a brother to me. Um, you know, I was fortunate enough to work with him in Toronto for a couple of years. Um, you know, he's still somebody who I, you know, reach out to from time to time, just, you know, talk about life, talk about hoops, talk about society. Um, you know, he's a, um, 
he's 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 a very strong willed individual. Um, you know, he dreams big. He did deliver a championship to the to the people of Toronto, to the people of Canada. And, you know, he has broken down barriers. There's no doubt about that. He's broken down barriers here in the United States, in Canada. He's broken down barriers in Africa on the continent. Um, you know, you talk about people who aspire to be uh, similar to what he is. He definitely has that kind of following. And I definitely think he's broken down barriers uh, in a really, really positive way. Who are some of the other people that guided you along these journeys to, to find you in the place that you are now? You know, I think about people like Wayne Embry. You know, Wayne Embry, he's a pioneer. I mean, Hall of Famer, he was a great player, an incredible executive. You know, I had the fortunate opportunity to work with him in Toronto on a daily basis. Um, you know, just sitting and having a coffee with him and having him tell stories. Um, you know, sharing those things about his battles. Um, you know, going through it as a player. You know, being on the road and, you know, being called the N-word. You know, being in a position um, you know, as a top executive of a franchise and, you know, being scrutinized by people, you know, not only internally, but externally, the fan base, other players, other executives, and, you know, the lessons he's taught me and how to deal with those situations, I take them to heart. I've taken them to heart. And I, you know, I, I have the ability now to use those as I kind of lead this franchise along with the rest of the executive team as we try and build a championship contender here with the Bulls. I don't know if you feel this way, but I know for me in the last nine, 10 months, even while we're living in the COVID world and the civil unrest and all these other things, it's in a strange way, I've never felt freer in terms of speaking how I feel as a black man in this country and this society and what we're in. What what are some of those pressures look like for you in terms of, because, you know, if you don't hire the black coach, you know, come on, bro. And then, you know what I mean? Like those, even with the, even with the West Unsell Jr., uh, you know, uh, talk or rumors around this team and then the team going with Billy Donovan, like what, what are some of the unspoken pressures or some of the pressures that maybe people who aren't walking in your shoes don't really know that you're dealing with? Sure. I mean, are there pressures like in that light? There's no doubt about it, but you know, when you're surrounded with people who are really smart and really committed and really um, intent on doing and making the right decisions, those things don't creep into the conversation. You know, with respect to our coaching search, we did a complete and thorough coaching search. Um, mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, we decided that Billy Donovan was the right coach for us. Um, we interviewed um, 10 to 11 candidates, um, all from diverse and different backgrounds. Um, and we weren't just checking the boxes. To me, those were the best 10 or 11 coaches. And the person who won um, who, who won the competition was Billy Donovan. Right. Um, and there's no doubt about it. For what we need right now, he's the perfect coach for what we're trying to build here in Chicago. Um, so there are pressures, but if you allow those things to kind of seep into what you're doing, then you're not really doing your job. See, I need you to talk to the people that I talk to when they ask me for money or, the, you know, take something like that, because that's that's the kind of answer. Can I can I just clip that and stock that and send that out? Uh, <laughs> we went through a tumultuous year in 2020 and uh, 2021 looks like it's off to a little bit of a rough start as well. Uh, what gives you hope as we move forward as a community? No doubt about it. 2020 was, you know, it was a challenge for all of us. And I think we're still all going through that today. Um, you know, some of the lessons I think we've learned is we're a pretty resilient society. Um, I do think things are going to get better. Um, you know, January 20th is right around the corner. And I do think, you know, you talk about leadership and how leadership can really um, set the path for, you know, hope. I think January 20th brings a little bit of that hope for us. You know, I think the vaccine is here, although the rollout's been, you know, rather slow and monotonous at times. I do think that brings another element of hope for all of us. Um, you know, it's more specifically to basketball. I mean, you know, like I said, we made the coaching change and you know, I think Billy's been unbelievable for our kids. I call them kids because they're still all really young. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we started off the year 0-2, and, and I think people were like, oh, man, here we go again. But, you know, in that third game, you lost a, a close one. And I think every game since, we've been in every single game, and we've been extremely competitive. We just came back from the West Coast where we played, you know, arguably two of the best teams uh in, in, in the Western Conference. And, you know, we were right there with under a minute to go, both one possession games. So there's hope, you know, not only in, you know, outside of these doors, but I also think inside of these doors here at the Advocate Center, there's a lot of promise. There's a lot of hope. And, you know, hopefully we, we uh, put together a few wins here 
in the next few weeks. All right, so Black history doesn't always have to be solemn and heavy or bereft of fun. I keep reading about how clean you always are. And I'm going to reference this Toronto Sun column written by Steve Simmons, who quote says, at six foot eight, he was hard to miss being smooth and personable and forever well-dressed. So Mark Eversley, where does this sense of style come from, my man? No, that's, uh, I didn't realize that Steve had written that. That's pretty funny. Um, you know, he's a media guy. So I was probably trying to like dodge him as I was in and out of the Air Canada Center in Toronto. I don't like the way you said that media guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, you know what? Growing up, my father's always taught me, you know, you know, I'm 6'8". I can't just sneak into a room and people not notice me. So if people are going to notice me, they might as well see me like, you know, something like, like something fresh. So um, it's always been part of me, you know, when I first started with the Raptors, you know, it was a very, I call it corporate environment, you know, where suits were not required, but encouraged. So, you know, I kind of just took it upon myself to make sure that uh, I always look clean. So it's something that's just stuck with me. Um, you know, for us, you know, me being six, eight and black, people are going to notice me. So, you know, I, I, I've always prided myself on putting together uh, a nice outfit. So and let it be noted that this is the first time that a general manager in Chicago sports history has used the word fresh when describing. <laughs> so I'll, uh, I'll, I got two more for you. I'll let you go because I know sure. you're in. Uh, in London, England and Toronto, Canada. What does Black History Month mean, if anything? I think when you look at, um, you know, England or Toronto, you know, especially Toronto. Toronto is probably one of the most diverse cities in the world. It's probably the reason why we moved from London to Toronto when I was four years old. Um, you know, my neighborhood looked very much like a Benetton ad. I mean, you know, everybody looked different and, you know, that was comforting for us. So, um, you know, Toronto is a very diverse city. It's a, it's a metropolitan city, it's cosmopolitan. And, uh, you know, it's something that I grew up in and, you know, I'm very comfortable in that environment. So I think it means a lot. I think it speaks to the culture. Um, I, I think it speaks to who Canadians are. So, you know, I'm a proud Canadian. I do hold a U.S. passport as well. So, um, but uh, it's just how I grew up in, you know, it's an environment that I, I grew up in and I'm very comfortable in. I see you mentioned that with KC as well. I always got to let people know that, you know, you're a dual <laughs> citizen, you're legal everywhere. Uh, uh, last thing I have for you, what will it mean to you, Mark Eversley, to be the first black general manager to win an NBA championship with the Chicago Bulls? That's a good one. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think anytime you win a championship, you know, it's, it's, it's about the team, you know, whether you're talking about the players, the coaching staff, you know, the executive leadership team, you know, if you deliver a championship to a city, obviously there's gonna, you know, that comes with incredible pride, um, you know, but all of those, all of those functions need to be aligned. And that's really our job is to align all of those people and make sure we're all saying the same things. And, you know, as Billy would like to say, pulling the boat in, in, in the same direction. So it would bring incredible pride. And, you know, if we, we, if we were able to deliver a championship, again, to me, it's about who's next. And, if there's a little boy or a little girl, a little kid anywhere who looks up to me and says, wow, there's a dude from London, England who grew up in Toronto, went to school in the US, you know, worked for four different teams, but led this team to a championship. I can aspire to do something like that. Then I'm doing something right. So, you know, that's what I aspire to do, inspire little kids and, you know, give them a little bit of hope that, you know, they can reach the level that I've, I've reached right now. And they should also know that you know, I, I aspire to do more things just beyond what I'm doing today. No doubt about it, man. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, you are Black History, my man. Thank you. I appreciate it.